We're gonna have to watch that temper of yours. In 1962, comic readers were introduced to Bruce Banner and his alter ego, the Hulk. The story goes, Bruce Banner, a scientist, in an attempt to protect someone from a nuclear blast, gets exposed to gamma rays and is forced to turn into a green hulking beast every time he gets angry. The comic garnered some popularity, but it wasn't until the 1977 TV show, The Incredible Hulk, featuring Bill Bixby as Banner and Lou Ferrigno as the Hulk, that the character took on its recognizable, iconic status. Bixby's version of the Hulk would continue on all the way through 1990, as he and Ferrigno were as associated with these characters as Christopher Reeve was with Superman, the character wouldn't be adapted again until the 2000s where we got 2003's Hulk and 2008's The Incredible Hulk. Let me say from the start that I don't think either of these are great films, but they do deserve credit for taking their share of risk, not the least of which is adapting the Hulk. 2003's Hulk is an origin story showcasing how Bruce Banner became afflicted with Hulkness. David Banner is a scientist working on advanced healing factor for the military. When his boss General Ross refuses to let him test on human subjects, he tests on himself. But at the same time he conceives a son, Bruce, who carries on this mutated DNA. After a series of traumatic events, Bruce is left with the Foster family and he grows up to become a scientist. He accidentally gets a dose of gamma rays, turns into the Hulk when he's angry, and is ultimately captured by the military. After this, chaos ensues. A big chunk of the film is spent examining the psychological implications of his turning into the Hulk and entails an attempt to discover his repressed memories from his traumatic childhood. Essentially, the film becomes an allegory for the treatment of mental illness. The reason director Ang Lee went with this direction is that he wanted to make a low-concept comic book film that could be taken seriously in a cinematic medium. In some sense, he succeeds. He portrays the psychological aspects well. And in many ways, he doesn't. First of all, the origin of the Hulk is not an intriguing story. Imagine a Spider-Man origin without the Uncle Ben stuff, without the learning of responsibility. Grant would probably argue that's what the Amazing Spider-Man was. Secondly, the film fails from a character standpoint. I'll talk more about this in later sections. Lastly, the film is very poorly paced. There are a number of filler scenes which serve no purpose, and I'll point those out as we go along. And one of the biggest complaints I hear about this film is that it's boring. I'll examine why people think that. 2008's The Incredible Hulk, directed by Louis Leterrier, is far simpler. It's an action sci-fi film about Banner on the run from the government while trying to cure himself from turning into the Hulk. As the film goes along, a theme is reinforced about how the whole world seems to be against him either curing himself or being left alone. And he has to overcome these hurdles to either accept or defeat what he's become. Unlike the O3 film, this film isn't especially ambitious or risky story-wise. But at the same time, it seems to correct a number of the issues with that film, while making a decently engaging story. The Incredible Hulk started off as a sequel to the O3 film. Banner begins here where he ended in that film. 
But with the inception of the larger Marvel Cinematic Universe that they were aiming for, and the criticisms of the O3 film, The Incredible Hulk followed the popular trend of rebooting. It's as much an adaptation of the original Bill Bixby Hulk television show as it is of the comics, since it carries on the man-on-the-run concept from it, and it refers to an origin that's very similar to the one in the show. Notice the intros are very similar. Bill Bixby set an important precedent. You better make Banner an interesting character to watch, because he's the one we're spending most of our time with. I find Eric Banner's Bruce Banner from the 2003 film to be just downright uninteresting. Since the nature of the story relies on him being emotionally withdrawn, most of the time he doesn't even become particularly likable or even distinct. He's just a boring, everyday scientist. But we have to make a presentation on Tuesday. Uh... And you're going to make it with me. I think I should. Yeah, you're great with that stuff. On paper, there's nothing really wrong with this. Most of the people came to see the Hulk. The problem is that we're spending a vast majority of the running time with this guy. He doesn't even turn into the Hulk until about halfway through the film. Now, because Banna's Banner, <laughs> Banna's Banner, is so emotionally withdrawn, we lose the chance to emotionally connect with him. To top it off for a protagonist, he's not a proactive character. He's just dragged from plot point to plot point, with at times little regard to what's going on. He's just captured and forced to go through experiments for most of the movie. I haven't seen a protagonist dragged around this much since Neo. Look how he reacts when he learns he's turning into a big green monster. I had the most vivid dream. It was like being born, coming up for air. Light hitting my face and screaming. My heartbeat. Like boom. 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 Are you scared? Are you gonna try to cure yourself? I don't know. The movie spends so much time on Banner's psychological trouble, but because we don't have any reason to like or root for Banner as a person, we don't care about this stuff. We just want him to turn into the Hulk already. He's kind of like Anakin Skywalker in that way. We get it. You're an asshole. Put on the Vader suit already. With this boring, stale Bruce Banner, we also get our first filler scene. We see teenage Banner being told by his stepmother that he's going to achieve great things when he's an adult. We're not going to get to know teenage Banner, and we're never going to see the stepmother again. All this running time eating boar fest of a scene does is establish that Bruce is having nightmares, which is re-established when he's an adult. Hulk hinges on a plotline of discovering what Bruce's repressed memory is. It becomes a mystery for Bruce and his ex-girlfriend Betty Ross to solve. The thing is, Betty's father, General Ross, already knows what happened. I'm no mental health expert, but why doesn't General Ross just tell Bruce about his repressed memory? Instead, we have to wait around for a big chunk of the film with scenes like this, where General Ross seems to get mad at Bruce without actually telling him what happened. Why are you asking me? I don't remember. I was always told my father was dead. Don't play with me! You were four years old when you saw it. When I saw what? You were right there! How could anyone forget a thing like that? Now, there's nothing wrong with a psychologically introspective film, but you've got to get the basics right. You have to make us like Banner, and the mystery has to make sense. In contrast to the 03 film, Norton's Banner from the 08 film is actually very proactive, and at times very interesting. This Banner begins in a somewhat dark place. He's away from home, he may have inadvertently killed his girlfriend, He's in an environment that makes it hard not to hulk out, an environment that he has to adapt to, and he has to constantly look over his shoulder at the potential military people following him. I say he's proactive because he's always trying to find a means of curing himself via the help of his colleague Mr. Blue. Further, unlike his 2003 counterpart, we get to examine other dimensions of his character despite our not delving deeply into his psychology. There's a great moment with his character where he's at work and he sees a, a worker harassing a female employee. At first he doesn't want to interfere because he knows it would risk him turning into the Hulk, but he quickly changes his mind and he stands up for the woman. Martina, almost 
far conmigo? Soy de aquí, gringo. ¿Todo bien? Tengo un problema. Sin problema. Estás mal. Ay, no me dejes con fome. ¿Qué? No me van cuando yo fome. He flusters saying the famous TV line, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry, because he just learned the Portuguese word for hungry. In that brief scene, we get to see Banner as a person, as despite being cautious for himself, he was still willing to stand up for someone, in an admittedly flawed human way. And this is all without English dialogue in the scene. In fact, many of his scenes are done without any dialogue at all. We see Norton convey what's happening simply with his expressions. We're made to feel the events that happen instead of being told that they're happening. Because of Norton's performance, we almost want him to stay as Banner. I actually like the action scene the best, where Banner's running from the military, and he has to deal with both the bullies from earlier, and a heart rate that's constantly bringing him closer to changing into the Hulk. Both versions of the Hulk are actually pretty well done. This is one character where he's made to convey everything with his expression. Of course, 08 version has a bit of an advantage over the 03 version because of advancements in CGI, but that doesn't keep us from feeling for both. Each one is put in positions that are unfavorable, so we can't blame them for their reactions. And when they do react, it's with some pretty clever ideas. Their places in each story, of course, heavily impacts Banner's. The O3 version is the embodiment of all the trauma that Banner has repressed. Since Banner is emotionally withdrawn, his emotions manifest as this giant green rage monster. The O8 version is the result of Banner unknowingly attempting to replicate the formula that made Steve Rogers Captain America, and his change into the Hulk occurs from his heart rate increasing instead of hidden anger and trauma. Conceptually, the 03 version is more interesting, but the 08 version's place in the story makes this Banner's arc more interesting. As we saw, Norton's Banner cares about other people. That he turns into a dangerous rage monster that can hurt others is something he can't accept. Over the course of the film, he's made to realize that Hulk is actually a part of him, and that with extreme focus, he could use the monster to save others. This is where the superhero aspect of the character is brought to the forefront, and it is this that the O3 film fails to realize, at least until the end. Unfortunately, the O8 film, in its attempt to distance itself from the O3 film and play up the action aspects, undercut its concept by removing scenes that would have better fleshed out the character. Many of these were written by Edward Norton. One scene in particular shouldn't have been cut. This alternate opening featured Banner attempting to kill himself in the Arctic to prevent the monster from hurting others, but his turning into that monster prevents that. Note the brief appearance by Captain America in this scene. Also note that this scene was made canon when Ruffalo Banner mentions it in The Avengers. This scene shouldn't have been cut because in a later scene, after Banner goes through his arc, he risks his life again because he wants to turn into the Hulk to defend the city from the Abomination. Given how much Norton committed himself to the part, he actually stood in to do Hulk's facial expressions, it's the cutting of this scene and many other character developing ones that made him not promote the film and leave before he could play Banner in The Avengers. <laughs> 